Yes, sir. It's, it's an honor, bro. Nice to meet you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Boss, yes, man. Sir. How you What's doing? Hey, Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, do your thing. Oh, Back in. That's what you want? Well, I got two or three people in hats here. Like, I, you got, he's the alpha white part of forever, by the way. He's too cute. I mean, I'm, I'm the hat man on the show. You guys are in hats. I mean, heavy like, hats. I just want to let you know. Heavy, um, heavy oh, you're out for the white part. At least these I guys just donated uh, 1500 to Fanatics because I was trying to buy jerseys of all the guys that's been on our shows so I can start wearing them. Just put it out there. Thank um, by the way, I just listen, got a fanatics email. I, I just be, I may I not showed be able to afford this apartment if, we, if you don't do that. So thank you. Yeah, you're I, welcome, I, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome, bro. Can I get a car better than this one? I think we can get you a car better. Than this. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is my guy. He, he's got the hats going. I like that for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm a hat guy. Yeah, man, that's cool, bro. I like, I no. like, hold on. That, that makes me, if I had my phone, I would call the guy who runs Liz first and show him. We, we'll get you a better Yeah, one. man, I got, you know, I don't know if this is special or not. I got my My Lowe's card and then my Liz card. <laughs> who cares about Lowe's? You got your Liz card. That's what matters. <laughs> Are you trying to be cards. fashionable at Lowe's? Hey, Ruth. <laughs> So I don't wear hats because of the people on this show, I have so the best edge up. Hold on, you I got the best on. edge up though. I want it, but I want to hear this. You, you don't curse. I do. So so I curse. Unless you're gonna fight. So I curse when you people, don't wear hats. I don't wear hats. No. He's, he's, hat he's, today. he's different. He's very different. I like I just don't. Saying. Like I don't feel like I need to curse in just like normal conversation. No. I mean, I just have a foul mouth. But see, like I don't, and like I want people to know that. If I got to this point, the next step step is slapping you with like my palm. That's where the curse starts coming. Oh, for sure. He got a quick trick. He he was always little his whole life. That's true. You guys was down in uh like uh in the Avenues Mall and Regency and all that back in Jacksonville back in the day, right? So that's where it started. So right, I right, started right. the company even ten years earlier, and then we bought Fanatics, and then we bought Fans Edge, and kind of made it into one company. Right. So. That's where that where fanatics were started in Jacksonville. Right in yeah. the mall. In yeah, the, that's I remember. Yeah, that. where'd you grow up? Yeah. No, I, I know Jacksonville played, yeah, in '98, yeah, but I grew up in Florida. Right, South Florida. No one knows that, by the way. That's why you, you need history. <laughs> exactly. That, that, that exactly. fanatics started in Jacksonville yeah. for sure. Yeah. 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 No, yeah, most people don't know that. Also, too, only people that were ever in Duval would care. <laughs> this guy is something else. You know what? As much as he says that. Jacksonville actually almost owns the fucking Steelers. They've won more championships, but we've kicked that ass a lot. I know I'm. I'm Say that one more time. I Jacksonville. Have, the Jaguars. The Jaguars. It's been so long. It's been I, I so, think, I it's think been so our long record since, since they've won anything. Freddie T. Right? Freddie T. The first thing is, I just like, tell you talking to Rube like he didn't own the team. Like he understands well, I, team I, sports. In, 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 fair, in fairness, that. in Pennsylvania. In, in, in fairness, I can't say that. I don't think a Jacksonville Jaguars is a. Team that's doing that wins well games late. No, so I so it's that's a fair, true. It's a I mean, I have, I have to so agree. Like, yeah, it's good transparency. It's just truth. Back. It is what it is. Yeah. But when he when he goes on his runs to talk about their championships, and I'm like, well, you know, matchup for matchup, we kicked that ass. It's just hey, that Ruth, we didn't finish it off. I just have a question. That's it. Uh, when you were an owner of the Philadelphia 76ers, and you think about the 82 game season. Were you concerned with who you beat <laughs> on a Tuesday night in February, or were you more concerned with winning a championship? But listen, I could be wrong. And so if I'm you, wrong, you, tell you, me you know, the which way matters. you asked that question was just so perfect that I think we all know if we don't win for each season, the championship, we failed. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, for all of our subscribers, thank you for tuning in again. Uh, we are just so excited about this show. First of all, thank you to DraftKings. Also happy that for continuing to be a sponsor. Today I got Chan, I got Freaky Freddy, but I also have Michael Rubin, uh, a man to me who even before meeting him does not understand how much I admire what he's done, not necessarily as it pertains to being an entrepreneur, but as it pertains to giving back to a community that he could ignore. And so, uh, like Freddie T always says, though, man, listen, anybody can podcast, but not everyone can pivot. And for us, this is an extremely important show because of the man that has given his time to talk to us, but also the different topics 
um, that we're going to hit. And so I feel like people tune in. And I'm going to call him Rube from now on. It's Michael Rubin. You know his damn name. And Rube, like, I feel like people tune in to our show for so many different reasons. Uh, sometimes there's just life lessons. Sometimes there are gems of wisdom that are dropped that people feel like they can learn from and continue to move forward in their lives. And obviously, when we get someone so successful in business as you are, all people see is the pinnacle, right? Like, we see where he is. Like, we understand that, like, this not very tall white man can get, like, a lot of very tall black people to put on white clothes and come to his party in the Hamptons, which I've never been invited to. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> I feel right? like you're a little salty about that. I'm super salty about it. But let's start with this, bro. You sold skis as a young man. Like, you had this entrepreneurial spirit as a young man growing up in your parents' house. How was that cultivated? Well, first, I just want to thank you for the warm introduction, because I'm thinking that this could be the only time we're nice to each other. It could be, <laughs> could be this particular second, so that was a really nice and warm introduction. I appreciate the kind words. I look forward to only giving you a hard time for the balance of, I like of that, this, this, this podcast. I'll go but, that way. You know, I want to say one nice thing before the banter really starts. Um, from that point forward, it'll be all fun. White party, I think you've got a lot of work to do. I just want to say that up front. Yeah, because um, I started like, little baby, it's me, it's he, great. He's not Jason. important enough. Yeah, I, I mean, these guys maybe, but you know. <laughs> he's not important enough. You love that I mean, so much. Oh, tell him. I mean, I mean we, 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 got, we got to evaluate this. We got to, we got to evaluate it. We got to keep him on his toes. All right, so y'all probably know what the show. I'm gonna go. Okay. <laughs> Speak and see. Look, here's the bottom line. I was a god awful student. I was a terrible athlete, and like for me, you always go to what you're good at. And there was one thing I was good, always good at. Like, I could work. Like, I loved to work. I loved business. I loved selling things. I loved making money. Not because I cared about the money, but for, like, the sport of it. Because, again, you gravitate to what you're good at. So I did start in business li literally at, like, eight years old. I would go and sell, you know, stationary door-to-door. -door. I'd have, when it would snow, I'd have five people working for me. And I'd, I'd, like, go sell a snow shoveling. By the time I was 12 years old, someone explained to me about... Um, how I could kind of fix skis and tune skis. So I started a little ski tuning shop in my parents' basement. And um, by the time I was 14, as crazy as this sounds, I actually ran a ski shop in a, in a shopping center about 10 minutes from my parents' house. Mike and Ski and Sport, right? Mike Ski and Sport. <laughs> and by, by the way, by the time I was 16, I almost went bankrupt. And so I'd, I'd seen it up and seen it down before I was even legal to do most things. So, you know, for me, but it gets back to like, you do what you, like, you love doing, and I always love business. That story, just to hit on that, where you were 14 and made, I think, $25,000 or something, and then the story is, you were 15, you bought a Porsche. And it's funny to hear you say you went bankrupt at 16. It could have had to do with buying the Porsche first. Did, I was gonna say, Maybe, did you learn like, the lesson? Like, I have a friend of mine, the friend, if they hear this, will know who they are, who has a, uh, they have a, a Lamborghini Jeep, and I make fun of them all the time, saying like, that Lamborghini Jeep is probably like, 5% of your net worth, and like maybe you shouldn't buy a Lamborghini Jeep. Well, the Porsche at that point was probably like 150% of my net worth. <laughs> but at 15, you know, I had to make some of those mistakes early. But you know, look, for me, I had real early success. I ran a ski shop at 15 years old. I probably did a half a million dollars in business that year. Wow. Probably made 100 grand, okay? Mm -hmm. And then I got cocky. And then, you know, there's this thing about the ski business. Like, if you sell skis, it's kind of helpful if it snows. Okay, so like when it didn't snow, the year I was 16, I ended the year and literally I had um, $80,000 of inventory. I had this Porsche, which we paid about, it was a used Porsche, I think like $40,000 for. And then I had about $200,000 of liabilities. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this, I probably got sued 100 times in the spring of when I was 16 years old to where the local sheriff would show up at my house every day with lawsuits. And there's this nice woman, she'd come in and she's like, hey, here are today's lawsuits. I give her a hug. Hey, what's up? How you doing? I got sued a hundred times. And um, I learned very quickly about how to win and how to fail, but also what to learn from my failures. And the good thing was, um, I thought I was going bankrupt. And I actually hired a bankruptcy attorney. And I, it's the first time, my, my parents had never- How old are you when you hired a bankruptcy 16, attorney? 16, because I was going wow. bankrupt. So I grew up in a very middle-class family and, and I'd never borrowed a penny from my mom or dad. And now I was like, okay, I'm going bankrupt. It's, it's a wrap, like, you know, not only do I suck at school, I suck at sports, I also suck at business, just because <laughs> now I'm going bankrupt. But I got the Porsche, by the way. I did have the Porsche still, okay? And I was actually legal to, at least when I was about to go bankrupt, I was legal to drive it, but, um, 
I basically uh, hired this bankruptcy attorney, and they're going through everything, and they got these creditors together. They, like, we had a creditors meeting with like 50 creditors. These people like growling at me. To, and, the, and the guy said, by the way, how old are you? I said, I'm 16. He said, you know you can't incur debt till you're 18. I said, really? And we actually, um, the, the creditors said, hey, if you'd pay me $38,000, they'd, they'd settle the debt. And it was the only time I ever went to my parents for money. I said, hey, can I borrow $38,000 from my uh, mom and dad? said, look, that's like, you know, basically your college savings for you to go to college. We'll lend it to you on one condition. You have to agree to go to college and mm -hmm. give up this, this dumb business thing. And so, like any deal maker, I made the deal. You know, <laughs> I need to give up business to get, get out of this thing. Done. I'm out of business. Give me the $38,000. And um, we had one thing happen a few weeks later, which is there was another ski shop that went bankrupt. And they had $200,000 in inventory. And it got auctioned off. And I bought it for $13,000 for 200 grand of inventory. And so I, remember, I did like, I thought I had a great way to get out of the $38,000 of debt. I just buy this inventory, sell for more money. So I went back to my mom and dad, hey, I just need $13,000 more. And my dad was like, are you out of your fucking mind? Like, you think I'm giving you another $13,000? <laughs> right. Hell no. Now we have 50. Well, now, by the way, I thought, now I thought I was going to go to jail because I couldn't pay the bank. It was like, I, now, now I had to pay the $13,000 off. So I actually went and asked different people. And I found a neighbor who said, look, I'll lend you the $13,000, but you're going to make a fortune. So I need $1,000 a week interest. And so I borrowed the $13,000 for $1,000 a week interest. So I get, got the yellow page. This is when they had phone books. Going through the yellow pages to find different ski shops. Hey, do you want to buy some of these skis? And actually, within three weeks, I was able to get the $16,000 I needed to pay this person back and had all of the balance of the inventory. The reason I tell you this story was at 16, I almost went bankrupt, lost it all. And by 18, I was the largest buyer and sell of closeouts in the ski business. And by 21, I was doing over $100 million a year, making over $10 million a year, buying and selling clothes out, footwear, and apparel. But Rube, so, why would you, so why would you go to college, though? Because like you went well, to school. I, look, I had a very long tenure at college, and I was there for about three weeks. I, le I learned all the local bars. Um, I learned how to sit in the car in the parking lot and make, by the way, the phones were like as big as my head um, that I had when I was, remember, this is 32 years ago. And I would literally, um, sit on the phone outside of college and I'd make deals. And I went back to my mom and dad and said, hey, look, bad news is I'm dropping out of college. Good news is paid you back your 38,000, paid for college, I'm out. And that was my experience in college, literally. It's crazy, you're, you're, you're 16 and you're saying, you're thinking, you're talking about bankruptcy, you're talking about debt, you're talking about creditors. 16 year olds don't learn that, but I see this big ass monopoly game over here, like a super size. You must have had, been, had some sort of Monopoly background, like where do you get your business acumen from at that age? You know, for me, I, like people think I'm being self-deprecating when I say like I was a god awful student. I was that bad of a student. Like I was not, I didn't learn that way. Like my senior year of high school, I missed 70 days. I remember when I graduated high school, my mom and dad went up to the principal and said, did he really graduate? Like is he really, is, is this diploma real? Did he really graduate? Um, you know, for me, the quality that I always had was street smarts. And so the way I learned was by asking lots of questions. Mm -hmm. And you know, I see it in you guys already. You guys know how to ask lots of questions, right? You know what? If you use that skill in business, no question's a dumb question. And by the way, even if it is a dumb question, I don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. I'll still ask it. So I ask anything that's on my mind. I'm always learning. I'm always growing. I'm always asking questions. And that's how I learn. So how did I learn about accounting? I asked questions. By the way, I also never was afraid to fail. Like, I didn't care. Like to me, you know, if you're fearless and you just keep going for it, yeah, you're gonna have a bunch of failures, you're gonna make mistakes, but then you have big wins that come after that. So for me, all of my learning has been because I've been a sponge. I've been able to get the right people around me, just ask lots of questions and learn. You never doubted yourself. There was no point. At bankrupt. You're sitting there with fifty, like you say, fifty grown ass men, and you, you didn't even kill doubt me. you. Yeah, that one today. They wanted their damn money. <laughs> Rube, like <laughs> you owe me money, I want my money. There was never a point. From then till now, that you ever doubted, Rube doubted Rube? Honestly, no. Never. Not one second, not one late night. First of all, I've, I've always grinded so hard. And people, it's funny, people see your life like they see the fun parts. They see, you know, the white party all over Instagram. They see our Super Bowl party. They see the fun things that we do. The reality is I'm like 99% like locked in, crazy work ethic. I grind every day. I'm up by four or five o'clock in the morning. I work till midnight most days. And so like, I just, I'm not one to look back. I'm not one to worry. I'll tell you a crazy story along the same vein. And this is one that 
most people don't know about me. So I sold my company to eBay, my first company to eBay for $2.5 billion in 2011. Two years earlier, I almost went down, just two years earlier. So I basically, um, when the financial crisis came in 2008, 2009, um, the way that I kind of made money was I was borrowing money from a big bank and then I was investing that money in the market. When the market fell apart, I had to pay this money back. And uh, our stock price had gone from $30 to $3. And so I wasn't able to borrow the money anymore. And there's something called a margin call. Essentially, you owe money to the bank. And so I owed the bank $50 million. I was able to get the loan down to $3 million by getting out of all these investments. I couldn't get the last $3 million. I remember like it was yesterday sitting in my bed. I'm like, okay, tomorrow's the day. It's a wrap. They're going to sell all my stock to pay back the $3 million. And I was completely calm, like just keep grinding. And there was one guy where I invested in. He was my, I was the first investor in his fund. I put $3 million with him. And I called him for the money 50 times. He kept saying, if I give you the money back, I have to give it to everybody else. And I can't give it back to you. And on the 51st time I called him, I would call him twice a day, three times a day. Like, yo, bro, I'm f***ing getting kicked out of my company. I'm going to get margined out of my company. You have to give me this money back. And I called him so many times, he finally said, like, you know what? Giving this annoying person the money back will be easier than um, hearing him call for the 52nd time. I got the money back the next day, paid the last $3 million off, and a year and a half later sold my company for $2.4 billion. Wow. So to me, like, the one thing you'll learn about me, my attitude is I never quit. I'm like the Energizer bunny. You cannot stop me. Like, no matter how many times I screw shit up, I just keep coming back and keep Rude, coming back. you're the, the CEO of Fanatics. You're co-founder of Reform Alliance, um, I would venture to say you don't do easy things, right? Like you, you, you don't do the, the normal, everyone's trying to do this, I believe it'll work things. What was it about you that made you feel like all these things were possible? Well, first of all, I really believe anything you set your mind to is possible. Like, in, now I won't say that about, am I ever gonna be able to you know, could I, you know, dunk a basketball and be a great athlete? No, that wasn't my skill set. But in business, for me, I believe anything I set my mind to is possible. And I also, again, this sounds crazy. I don't mind, like, I like failing too, because like, it's like, like, go for the process. Like, Tom Brady was just saying this to me. I did I, Tom, in front of our entire- Hey, time our- out though, time out, time out, time out, time out. Don't do that. You get a fat, you get salty? No, Rube, like, uh, first off, I'm not salty. I got beat Tom Brady. By, by, by and I've won Super hold Bowls. I've won Super Bowls. Hold on, hold on. Is, won it, hold on. is this already now? This is double in salt. AFC. Now, this is like salty about the white part. Every, I've got mean, no, one guy like, who said like, something like, intelligent. No, no. He, he says, but he says I was something actually about to say something nice about you if you just let me get to it. Yeah, I don't like nice things. I want to be mean to me. I want to be nice, though. I'm uncomfortable being nice. I'm saying, like, like you just threw that out. He was like, yeah. So Tom Brady was talking to my company. I think, like, Everybody understood Tom Brady was on a hiatus and the one person in like the real world he was communicating with and that, he was okay with this was, was actually Michael Rubin. This was probably a few weeks ago actually. I probably misspoke so I apologize for my misspeaking. So a few <laughs> weeks ago we had the honor of having Tom Brady in front of our company. And he, he, we were talking about like how do you deal with failures and one of the things he said that was so true because we were trying to get different analogies in sports to get to our, look we have, 10,000 plus associates of fanatics who work in this incredible sports company, but there's so many parallels from sports to business. And so I was trying to ask these different questions about like, how would you take things that you learn in football and apply them to business? And he was basically saying to me, like, look, you gotta run the right play. And even if you get the wrong outcome, you gotta just keep running the right play. And so the point was, you know, if I have the right process and the right play, I don't care if I fail, I'll just keep running again until I win, until I win, until I win. And so I'm unrelenting like that. And so I think so many people in business are scared to fail. Mm. And that stops them from ever taking the shot. And you know, if you, look, if you play offense and you don't take your shots, you got no chance of scoring. Right. And so that's for me, you know, I'm gonna take a lot of shots on goal. And I'm not always gonna score, but I'm gonna keep taking the shots. And the second I stop taking the shots, I'm done. And that's the way I feel. I love that. I love and, and, that. and Mike, like, this is the biggest f-ing couch I've ever been on in my life. <laughs> oh, it's really comfy. You I can't even I, lean, like, you can't lean you back. You know who we made this for? Joel Embiid. By the way, he came in, he loves it. This, I mean, this, you can't Because go. he's the only <laughs> motherfucker that can sit yeah. here yeah. and yeah. lean Shane. on the back, Mike. Right? But Shane, you missed it again. 
Like, like I think he gets it. Like, what I'm, like, so what I'm trying I, to. I know we're going. We have three guys here doing this. One guy's sensitive, two guys are not. Like, well, he's, he's the, like, like, he's the sensitive. Hey, oh, like, he's like, the sensitive Ken, guy hey, for sure. Like, oh, real, real, he, he, was, he was undrafted. I'm going to call him. Yeah, I he see. Was he's like, he always he's fighting. He's, he's always fighting for like, God. Like, so he's just going to be like, yeah, Joel Embiid was sitting on my couch. You know what? I'm not gonna say nothing else then. I'm gonna stop talking. But, but no, I'm saying, like, this, beautiful, man. And I appreciate you bringing us into we your house. You made a big person. Listen, and this we is, did. This is gorgeous. This man. was Thank not you for you, so but this, this is for the bigger guys. Okay, this is for the two. You know, I apologize for saying Joe's name. It's for the two of you. You, you're like me. Little, little guys stick together. <laughs> yeah, y'all can't Small even, kids. Can't Small even touch cats. the ground. Y'all little wiggle legs. But. We're also but, the most famous. Fun. Like, you, you get so excited about this business side. Like, you love making love money. It. And you're something two point four billion. Oh, right. There's B. We're all M's. I speak for them. We have M's. You have B's. Mm. But from there, like the the enjoyment of life, the ladies, the like the fun. Do you enjoy this thing? Because so, it does. It seems like you're just focused on earning. I don't care about money for money. I care about money for score. Like you want to win. Like how do you measure how you're doing? If you create value in your company, that means you're winning. Yeah. If you lose value, that means you're losing. Like a company's earnings shows how you're performing. And like, again, I can perform in business. So for me, like, I love what I do. Like I say, I'm so, every day I'm like, like, by the way, we deal with disasters every day. Shit goes wrong every day. If I look at my phone right now, there'll be, you know, some disaster I didn't deal with in the last 20 minutes. That's just life. But still, I, like I'm blessed, I'm lucky. I'm doing fun shit every day. You know, by the way, I turned 50, which seems crazy to me, um, last month. And actually, I can't use names anymore because it's Mr. Sensitive. We're gonna use a name. <laughs> no, no. Hey, listen. I, I, you hey. guys will always. Hey, you guys will always. I apologize. I got, use you guys names, bro. Respect. I was just Hold joking. On. So, use so names, man. Rob, so I was on a walk with Robert Kraft, and he said to me, he said, Michael, you know what? I said, I said, I'm actually, for the first time in my life, I'm actually, this is weird. Like, I'm gonna turn 50 in a couple of days. I'm like, this sucks. Like, how did I get so old? He said to me, he actually said, Michael, he said, every decade of my life has been the best decade. He said, and he turned 80 last year. He said, my 70s were the best year. He said, I'm going to make my 80s the best year. And so, like, I look at this and say, like, I just got into my 50s. I'm having a blast. I learn so much every day. I'm doing interesting things. I pick up things. I'm a sponge. I'm having a great time. But, like, I don't care about money. Like, there's nothing. Money is not changing my life in one bit, in zero way. There's nothing financially that's going to change my life. But I love the sport of playing business. And that's what I'm pretty decent at. That is fun for me. Do I enjoy it? Look, I'm going at a crazy pace. I mean, last night I went to bed and um, my girlfriend said it to me. She's like, I told her I was at 10th. I was like, I was exhausted. I've been up since four. I'm going to bed. She goes, Michael, if you go to bed right now, you will be up at three o'clock. I woke up at 1.15. I thought it was a new day. Okay. Wow. I worked from 1.15 till 4 a.m. I said, okay, I got to go back to bed. I fell back to sleep for like an hour. And then got back up. I slept four hours yesterday. That's like normal for me. Because I'm like, I'm excited to look at my phone. I'm excited to see what things, whether they're good or bad updates, whether they're good or bad things. Like it's just, that's the action I love. I thrive on it. Do you, you ever just, do you ever go on vacation? Like you said, you I have mean, a girlfriend. Like I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pull out of you. Yeah. I know she, you, can ask, you can ask anything you want. I know she pull. probably has a pretty good life. Yeah. Yeah. But you, yeah, you, you, you can ask, have a girlfriend. You can, any, but... you can ask anything you want. I, I'm, not, I'm not shy. So do I go on vacations? I move around a lot but I'm always working. Mm -hmm. So if you see me, if you're like one of my boys and you're on vacation with me, like um, my friend who I was making fun of, uh, I'll give him a shout out. His name is Will Macris, who, who owns the Lamborghini car, the, the $400,000 Lamborghini I keep making fun of. And mm -hmm. he's, he's killing it in New York. He's got a bunch of restaurants. He has Zero Bond and, and uh, just opened a new place, Alba and uh, Lola. It's actually three of the hottest places in New York. But he stays with me a lot in the Hamptons. And so he was with me in the Hamptons last weekend. It's, it's Labor Day weekend. And I'm in my office on Friday, you know, six before he wakes up until eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the night. Saturday, I'm in the office until finally they drag me out for lunch. I go back in the office. I'm working more. Sunday, I'm in the office. He's like, dude, you ever come out of your office? But I'm like, I'm having fun doing what I'm doing. And like, you know, we got a lot going on. So I do work really hard. So I move around to a lot of great places. Yeah. Um, but I say I'm always working in those great places. You maybe get like Christmas break is the only time when I like I, I lighten it up and maybe I do a couple hours of work a day versus like, you know, right. full beast mode. I love it. Ooh, and that's because I'm having fun. I will say if I'm having fun, that's the one time. If you get me in a really fun environment, then I'm a guy's guy. But as soon as that, like, you know, I'll have fun at the white party, it may take me a day to recover from that. Um, this guy's definitely never coming. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then like a day later, I'm back to killing it again. Yeah.
Hold up a second. We'll get you back to Michael Rubin. It's been an excellent interview. We have so much more to come. But let's talk a little bit about DraftKings and the early win promotions. Bet on any team, any team. They can actually suck because if they're up by 10 points at any point, you instantly get your money and they can lose. And we got a five for 200 that Chan's going to tell you about. You got to get in on it. Listen, $5 or better, and they're going to give you $200 in free bets. That's what we're doing for you. Promo code PIVOT. You go to DraftKings, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app, and $5 bet gets you $200 in free bets. We're going to do that for y'all. We always, they call it free game. We give y'all free money right now. Select states, we got the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Other places, we got Daily Fantasy. We got some for everybody. Pivot and make it happen. My drafted kings your undrafted king. And now let's get back to Michael Rubin. Yeah, I want to I want to pivot back really quick. And um, it's like a three part, right? Your love for sports. You know, how did that start? Where did that start? Um, and also fanatics, the evolution of it. And Mr. Kraft, you spoke about Mr. Kraft. I was in the page. I, I was with New England from 2009 to 2010. And he would come in the locker room and play this thing called fool's poker. Something like that, with the players. But that just shows how personable and down to earth he is. You know, and people look at him and they see his success and don't think that he should be so engaging, you know, with his employee. But he's an amazing owner. What sort of mentorship or leadership role has he helped you in being a better, you know, former owner of an NBA franchise? So I'd say it's much more than that, to be honest. I mean, okay. Robert is, and his, his oldest son, Jonathan, are two of my closest friends on the planet. I mean, I talk to Robert on a normal day, you know, two, three, four times a day. Wow. Um, you know, the thing you probably know about Robert that a lot of people don't is he is a kid trapped in an 81-year-old, you know, you know, he's 81 by age, but he's a kid at yeah. heart. And I'll tell you, like, the way I told you I learn is by getting really smart people around me. And like, I've learned so much from him from you talked about how personal, like one of the things, by the way, I say this all the time, most rich people suck. They're not fun. They're not, you know, they're not engaging. They're like, they're too serious. Like, mm -hmm. like why don't we have fun every single day? So Robert is very special because he's got that great personality that like he really can relate to yes. players. And by the way, how many NFL owners you look at and say, oh, they're, they're really related? They're not hanging out in the locker room. Right. Like and, and Robert's related, but he, by the way, he likes to ask questions. He likes to learn. It's so, like, I'll watch Robert. And I used to bring... Joel around Robert a lot, who would learn different things. You see, like Robert, like make no mistake, they won six Super Bowls through his ownership because of lots of little things that people don't see. They just look, it's become public, obviously. Everyone knows that, you know, you know, it wasn't, you know, a perfect, you know, 20 year run of everything. You know, you were there, you know more, more than I do. But like, you know, he is a great business person and a great owner and a great leader. But I've learned so many things, even from like a personality perspective, like you see how calm he always is. And like, someone pisses me off five years ago, like I was a maniac, but I learned to even be like calmer from him. Like I would talk something through with him and say like, you know, like I want to kill this person. Like, I can't believe this happened. He'd be like, take it down a couple notches. You know, let's, you know, take a deep breath. Right. Think long-term. You got to win the, you know, gotta, you got you to win this long-term, not just the battle. Right. Um, so I have a lot, I've been really lucky for me. There are a lot of people in my life, probably nobody more than Robert Kraft that I've learned a ton from them to help me. I'd say I've learned more from Robert in life and business than I have in um, in sports. Got it. So you're talking about, <clears throat> he told you to take it easy and win the long term. Going back to that fanatics question, the evolution, starting there with the company, and now you're it's just an amazing company, and I think you have plans to do other things you know, with the company, so uh, hit us with that. Yeah, well, first of all, I feel like we're just getting started. The company um, is, you know, it, when we spun out of eBay, when I bought it back from eBay in 2011, it was a $250 million business the year before. Um, you know, next year we're going to be, you know, we're getting close to a $10 billion revenue business. Um, the business has had exponential growth. We're in three businesses today. You know, we're in the um, merchandise business, most of it direct to consumer. You know, you'll buy at the NFL shop or the NBA store or Fanatics. We have uh, a big collectibles business where today we own tops. We've also won all the rights for the NFL, the NBA, WWE, UFC, NCAA that are all going to come on board in the next um, few years. We're getting into the online sports betting and gaming business. But look, at the high level, we're doing something that no other company is focused on, which is we're building a global digital sports platform where as a fan, you'll be able to go get really all of your digital sports needs in one place. Mm -hmm. 
And that is for me like such a, it's a big vision, but also like a dream to be able to give the digital sports fan everything they want in one place. And what's so exciting for me is we're just getting started. Like, we're not good at a lot of things we do. Like, there's so much improvements we need to do. There's so many things we need to do to get better as a company. And that's what drives me every day. Like, if the company were great, I wouldn't want to do it. That would be boring. I'd be like, okay, work's done. Like, for me, it's like, like how do we keep innovating? How do we make the experience better for the fan? How do we make it better for sports properties? Right. You know? And there's so much for us to do. So that's what's so exciting for me. So we're, we're in three businesses, um, you know, young in each of them, just getting started in the online sports and iGaming business. And yet we have this opportunity to give the digital sports fan anything they want in one place. And that's a massive opportunity. What's a win for you? It seems like you, you moved the ball on yourself. Because it's billions. Like, as you talk, it's just like the grind, the grind, the grind. But sports, the fourth quarter is going to come, the clock's going to run out, and there's going to be a score of a winner and a loser. Is there ever a win? It's funny. I asked Dana White the same question. Because as y'all... It's very similar how y'all talk. And Dan's a beast, yeah. He, like, Dan, he's but always... there's no, there's no finish line. Yo, you're a sports guy. You love sports. There's no finish line for you. Like, what, what's ne the, what's the goal? Never satisfied. But what's the goal? The goal is to build the most incredible company in the world. To me, the world's our opportunity. There's nearly eight pe billion people in this world. Um, you know, we're only in a few businesses today, and I think I've, you know, hopefully I've got, you know, 30, 40, 50 years left to, you know, do this at full pace and. You know, for me, I think I'll work this way when I'm 80 years old, 90 years old. Why? Because, because enjoy, why, are well, you, enjoy it. I don't Take know how, your I, billions I, I and go know, to I, an island. I don't why? know how to enjoy it. But, 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 let, let me tell you what I would do. Here's me taking my billions and going to an island. I go like this. I go like this. Okay, what do I do now? Huh? Wait, why is no, no, you know what? Why, no, I can, I can no, tell you no, what to no, do. No, 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 why is no Get one some see? bad women out there. Yeah, 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 get you yeah, a couple yeah, bottles of liquor, grow yeah, you a joint, yeah, yeah, and yeah, enjoy yeah, it. Go fishing, yeah, buy you a fucking yeah. yacht. Just enjoy but, life. But you know what I enjoy doing? Building. I'm a builder. I love that. You know, and by the way, like, look, I'm still a guy's guy. Like, I'm sure, like, we went out tonight. I could stay out till 5 o'clock in the morning and go harder than, you know, most people half my age. But then, do I, like, let's... I can do that every once in a while, but what do I love doing? I love building, I love working, and that's just who I am, you know? And by the way, you know, you'd ask certain, you know, unnamed athletes, because we can't use names here, uh, use certain unnamed athletes, I think you'd find people who would win the Super Bowl and say, like, it's over, like, what don't, how do I win the next one? And how do I get the next one? And like, you know, and, you know, I know different basketball players. I think if you would ask Kobe Bryant, you know, when he got done winning a championship, he's like, okay, yeah, the next day I'm right back. Absolutely. I'm right back at it. Like, I'm going to keep grinding like that. You, That's yeah. my attitude in business. I love boy that. Brady. That's why I believe Brady came back out of retirement, because I think he wants to win another one. Even though as much success he had, he wants to win another one on the way out. I really feel I, that way. I, I, I mean, I think, I mean, he's playing at the top of his game right now. It's insane. I mean, he's like, and by the way, think of what he's doing for everyone else to realize, you know, he's 45. Maybe, you know, it doesn't seem crazy for someone, you know, it doesn't seem crazy for someone to, you know, play into their early 40s now. I don't know. No one thought that was possible. You right. know, you were a dinosaur if you played in, the, in your mid-30s, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. He's, I mean, look at what LeBron's doing right now. Right, yeah, LeBron's amazing. But Tom the same. Tanner, you mentioned he bringing Tom, uh, Tom in. You brought him in and he spoke about leadership. Yeah. You know, I know Tom, sense of urgency, he takes nothing for granted. You know, I heard a bit of that, uh, I think I saw it on your page you know, a little bit of that conversation. What's your philosophy on building a, a, a winning, you know, company? Yeah, so a couple of things. First, I think if you're building a company, you gotta make sure that the opportunity you go after is big enough and figure out how you can make it better for your customers, okay? So if you think about my opportunity, digital and sports, those are two pretty big opportunities. And how can we make it better for the fan? There's so many things for us to do. But the question is, and it was actually fascinating for me because when I told people that I wanted to bring Tommy in to talk to our, you know, our, you know, nearly 10,000 associates, I think everyone was excited because he's Tom Brady. But what I, I, I actually spent a couple hours prepping on how could I figure out the things that would most translate to our associates from a business perspective? Not like, I didn't want to ask him football questions. I wanted to ask him about leadership questions. Right. And it's interesting because when you think about it, I think all of us, did, you know, when you win at an elite level, I think there is, um, there's so many similarities to how you win. For me, you know, I think my biggest philosophy is to um, get the best people in the world and to get them to work together. And by the way, if you get all great people, but you don't get them to work together, then you're destined to fail. And you see that in sports, right? How many super teams you see in basketball that get put together, right. but they don't get the right outcome? Yeah. Because 
You know, you gotta get, 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 the, get the great people to work together. So for me, it's about getting the best talent in the planet and setting a culture where they work together. And that's probably my number one um, philosophy because if you have the right strategy and you have the right people that work together, you're gonna win big in life. I see that you're big on relationships and putting people together. You got Jay-Z, Meek, you know, Lil Baby, James Harden, all these guys. You know, along with having leadership, relationships is equally as important, right? Yeah, for me, um, and I can't put enough emphasis on this, relationships are everything, okay? Because you, you have great relationships, you will figure out how to get through. Good times are always easy to get through, but with great relationships, you get through the tough times. And I will tell you that we have a really unique business, okay? And we've created, and we're gonna keep making the fan propositions. Every year, Fanatics is gonna get better. We're gonna ship boxes faster, have a better assortment. We're gonna, you know, innovate collectibles. You know, by the way, we, we're right about to announce something um, big in the next several days. Are any of you guys collectors of, of cards at all? Yeah, yeah, okay. for sure. So the number one thing that people tell me the collectors hate are redemptions. I mean, you know, it, like this year, there'll probably be 15 million autographs and sports cards, and probably 20% of those have a redemption card. We're going out, we're gonna go out public and say in the next couple of days, we're going to eliminate all redemptions in cards in the next year. Why? Because status quo isn't acceptable. Wow. So that's always the way we think, it's just how can we do something better? Um, we can't accept status quo um, because like that's our job is to innovate and to push. So I'll tell you, it's relationships that you fix that. Cause you know, the first thing I did was I called Tony Clark, who runs the Baseball Players Association. I said, hey Tony, like I never knew what a big problem this was you know, I've now seen hundreds of thousands of collectors who are telling us they hate this. They hate that they don't get the card. They get a redemption that says, you have to send this in. Hopefully sometime in the future, they'll get the card back. We have to eliminate this. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we talked about it's the relationship with the players. Like, by the way, we have contracts. We're going to have contracts with 3,000 individual athletes next year. You know, having great relationships are how we can build a better product, innovate more, do different things. So, like, relationships are everything. If people don't get that, you will never be successful in life. Right. If you build great relationships, like so much comes together. And so, you know, I'm guessing for you guys to do what you've done, you need to build great relationships like, how are you guys doing this together? Right. You know, we can make fun of you and still be boys afterward. For you sure. Know, you know, and that, that, so to me, I'd say, what's made me successful as a business person? Some street smarts, great work ethic, common sense, it's really street smarts. So it's really street smarts and common sense, relationship skills and work ethic. Do you think NFTs, because I know you're uh, interested in that business yep. too, right? It's gonna be amazing. Do you think that would eventually phase out the, the trading card and collectibles or would make them, or increase the value of them? Yeah, so I, first of all, from when we got in the NFT business, you know, kind of when it, when it first really started, we always thought that it was important to be in the business long-term because we thought we wanted to have hundreds of millions of sports fans who, who really connected with the content that we could put out through mm -hmm. NFTs. We actually thought, that the way we, we kind of predicted publicly that most of these things would fail. And by the way, 98% of these projects are failing today. 99% yeah, yeah, yeah. of these projects are failing today. Our belief is that you really want to think about how do you have a physical trading card and a digital trading card and kind of pair those together. Mm -hmm. I think it, like, you know, an, a, a trading card is really like a piece of art. Art is a multi-trillion dollar business. Why did uh, someone spend $12.6 million for that Mickey Mantle card last week? Because it's an incredible, special, scarce, collectible. I think you want to have NFTs that kind of support that. So to us, we look at it as an integrated product experience. Right. You know, I think uh, one of my more exciting parts about preparing for this interview was seeing you on talk shows and talk about the Reform Alliance, uh, seeing you lined up or sitting next to Meek Mill. Um, I think so many times, many of us who feel like we're on the front lines think we have a different perspective of it, and that's why we're there. Uh, you've been able to create an enormous amount of wealth. Uh, you don't necessarily come from the same places that some of the people you are willing to support in parole reform and probation reform has come from. And I think like that was what had me so excited to get an opportunity to meet you because you were doing things that didn't necessarily benefit you. When you look at what you've been able to create, what you've been able to do through the Reform Alliance, what are some of like the, the proud moments you have of that? And also too, I guess it's two part, 
What made you want to be a part of something like that? Well, let me start with the second part of the question first um, and give you an honest answer, which is I never wanted to be part of it. Wow. I got thrown into it. And by the way, and you know, what happens if you get thrown into a street fight? You got to fight. And so, <clears throat> you know, for me, you know, the part of the story that a lot of people forget is Meek had been one of my best friends long before he got sentenced to prison. Okay. And so, you know, I knew Meek, you know, three, four years earlier, we were, we'd probably been out a hundred times before he called me one day. He actually, I was with him on a Friday. He says, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you come to court with me on, on Monday? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, like if you really want me to come to court with you, yeah, I'll, I'll come to court with you. It was, you know, 20 minutes from my house. And that was the smartest thing he ever did. What he said to me is, Michael, I want you to see what happens to a black person when they go to court. Mm -hmm. And you know, I didn't think anything of it. I'm just like, okay, like, you know, he wants me to come to court with him, I'll come to court with him. Like, I just canceled my afternoon. I, w I went to court with him. And he had been, everyone knows this part of the story, he had been, um, you know, he had um, got a, a ticket actually on this highway here. Yep. Um, he got a ticket for popping a wheelie on a motorcycle and he had uh, broken up a fight in the airport where there was video surveillance showing that he, he had broken the fight up. And um, he said to me, like, I'm afraid I'm gonna get sent back to prison. I'm like, I'm like, Meek, shut up. Up, you're not going to prison for popping a wheelie on a motorcycle and for breaking a fight up in the airport. Not possible. And so I would like, I called him like, I knew he was nervous because he was like, he, he tried to be cool, but he was like uncomfortable that weekend. Yeah. And so I called him a couple times and said like, like trust me, I, you're good. Like you got nothing to worry about. So I went to court and um, it was a crazy experience. I mean, the story is very well known, but obviously the probation officer um, said, hey, we recommend no sentence for him. The, the district attorney said, hey, they recommend no, no sentence. And then the judge said, hey, we're gonna sentence you. And they asked me to get up and speak. And I talked about you know, my relationship with Meek, how well I knew him, you know, how he spent lots of time with my daughter, my mom, how he'd been around Robert Kraft, all the people in sports, you know, how look, no one's perfect. I don't know what his background was from years before, but like this is a good guy who's creating jobs for people, doing good things. And like the woman, the judge didn't say anything to me. She's like, okay, like go. Um, and then they sentenced him to two to four years yep. in prison Absolutely. for not committing a crime. Right. And that was like, my whole world changed that moment because, you know, I wasn't looking to get, get in the middle of this. I didn't understand the issue. I, to be honest, all the times he had told me about the crazy judge, and she was crazier than he ever said. Um, I didn't, it just, it, I never processed it. Right. When I saw that happen firsthand, which is why the smartest thing he did was get me to come to court, I literally looked at him and I looked at his mom. I said, I'm not stopping until I get you out of prison. And then That's I met so this, amazing, man. And then I met this woman, Desiree Price, who's the CEO of Rock yep. Nation. And Desiree, who I'd never met, was sitting, she said, hey, I'm Desiree, you know, I'm the CEO of Rock Nation. Um, I'm not stopping until I get him out of prison. I said, okay, I guess we're gonna do this together. And um, that was how I got involved. And the truth be told, in the first three months, I did not understand the issue. Mm. I did not care about the issue. It was all about getting my brother out of prison who didn't commit a crime. And like, to me, I'm like, okay, this guy, he's hopeless on his own. Okay, now you got someone who's got a decent amount of influence in, in, a, in Pennsylvania where I'm from, I'm like calling the governor, calling the district attorney, calling the, the mayor, calling, I'm calling every single person, putting pressure on everyone I can. And it wasn't until we hired, you know, dozens of investigators, found out that he'd always told me he was framed, he never pointed the gun at the police officer. Then a cop came forward and said, yeah, the whole thing's a lie, no one asked me that he was framed, he signed an affidavit. Then we still couldn't get him out of prison. And it was like toward the end of him being in prison where I said, Meek, things always happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know what? You went to jail for a reason. We got to do something about this. When you get out of prison, like we owe this to every other person who's affected by this. And Meek was like, "We got to change this." Jay Z was like, "We got to change this." Dope, Robert Kraft, man. by the way, he, he 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 was converted. He went from saying to me in the beginning, "Michael, why are you spending so much time on this? Why are you taking time away from your business?" To he went to prison. He saw Meek. Mm -hmm. He called me five times that night. He said, "How have you not got him out of prison yet? Why is it taking so long? I don't understand." And so you know, the day Meek got out of prison. Me, Meek, Robert, Jay Z said, like, we're gonna start a criminal justice organization so to awesome, fix this. Man. And I gotta tell That's you, it's amazing, bro. It's been, we've been at it for three and a half years. We said, we made up a goal, and people ask all the time how we came up with a goal. We said, we're gonna get a million people that are on probation or parole that shouldn't be on, out of the system. There's, there was four and a half million people at the time. This is three and a half years ago. We've already cleared a pathway for 650,000 people that are on probation or parole to get out earlier from the laws that we've changed. So it's been incredibly rewarding. Um, 
you know, having the honor to, look, this is an issue that affected me. Look, I, I, think, I think that makes it, and I don't mean to interrupt you, I think that makes it all the more admirable that you spent your time mm -hmm. giving to it, though, you know? Well, well, look, let's keep this real. When you're financially successful, it's easy to give money away, okay? Mm -hmm. I give lots of money away. That's easy. What's hard is to do the work. But this was like, and I'm not a religious person. I'm not, like, really that spiritual person. This was God's calling. Like, this wow. was like, you know, Meek went to prison um, to expose this issue. Right. He went, I mean, he went to prison three different times on probation violations for not committing a crime. And it was our responsibility to fix the underlying system. And I got to tell you something. We've, you know, we, we have an incredible board now. But, I mean, in addition to the four people that started it, we have so many other incredible founders, so many people giving real money to this. We've probably raised over $100 million for this issue. You know, we've put in, the founding team's put in probably 60 or $70 million so far. And we're making real progress. So it, it is, it's fun. Like, you asked me about what drives me. That's winning. It's, it's just winning in a different way. And I love that. Like, whether I'm winning in business, whether I'm winning in the reform lines, like, um, think of how lucky I am. I get to learn about an issue. I get to take my business acumen and help apply it there with an incredible team. And I get to see results, and, and that's fun. And by the way, if I failed, it'd be fun to fail and then learn to figure out how to win again. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> what, what, with that, man, I'm so interested in this, with the reform, like the checks and balance system. Be honest, like there's a lot of people in jail that should, should be there, and a lot of people that shouldn't. Yeah. Like, I mean, how, how do y'all navigate who, who you're fighting for? Right? Yeah, so it's a great question. First of all, when we started in 2019, there were 6.7 million people in prison and jail and on probation and parole total. 2.2 million people were prison and jail, four and a half million people were probation and parole. What, you talk about just getting lucky because you need luck to be successful. There's business, like luck, you need, it. by the way, you have a lucky play in sports that gets you a W. Luck is important. That Meek went to prison for not committing a crime from a probation violation made us focus all of our energy not on um, like bail reform, which is really complicated, it was really on probation reform. And what we want to do was make sure that people that don't commit crimes don't go back to prison. So essentially, we said, hey, there's four and a half million people on probation and parole. My gut, just as a just business instincts, probably a million and a half people should be on probation and parole. There's probably, at that point, three million people that should not have been. So I said, well, we gotta be able to get a million out. That's only one third, third of what it should be. So let's start with what I thought was an easy number. Everyone thought I was crazy. Like, yo, you said, like, why don't you go 10,000? I'm like, 10,000? Like, that. Like, let's come up with a big, juicy number. I'd rather fail trying to get that big number. And so the answer is getting people to have an earlier termination of their pro probation and parole sentences is so straightforward because it's proven that these long sentences don't help. I know a guy, Wallow, in uh, Philadelphia. I don't know if any of you guys follow him on social, social, social media. Oh, yeah. yeah, great guy, really inspirational mm -hmm. guy. He was involved when he was a kid, I think, in some, some robbery. No one was killed, fortunately. Um, you know, he did have a gun. He got out of prison. He's doing so much to make the world a better place. He's got 30 years of, of parole left right now. 30 years. This is a guy who's making the community better every day. Everyone knows it. He's still got 30 years of parole. That's lunacy. Like, like what are, you, are you trying to put someone back in prison, put someone back in jail? So for us, we're just trying to say, hey, we want to shorten the lengths of people that are on probation parole and not let people go back to prison if they didn't commit a crime. That seems pretty straightforward to me. Like, you don't need a, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. And by the way, are you going to find someone who did something wrong that we got off of probation parole? Sure. And you know what? Someone who was never, you're going to find someone in a great white neighborhood who murders the parents, too. Like, that's just life. I mean, th there's, you know, 300 million plus people that live in America. Like, I don't mean to be too coy about it, but like, you know, if you use big numbers of people, like, shit goes wrong. Like, you know. But I got to ask this, man. Just you're going to really ask quick. anything you want. All right. We've heard about the entrepreneur, you know, the friend. All this other sex is of the kid, but the father, right? Under meek circumstances and all the people that are in the system uh, unjust. As a father of, of three, right? Yeah. Does it ever, do you ever uh, think that these could potentially be your kids one day at some point? Because the world is crazy. You just never know. One thing about me, I'm not a good like reflective person. I'm not a good person to think about like, I don't really worry about what could go wrong. I just keep trying to like grind away the things that are important to me. So everyone's got a different personality. Like, you know, I'm paranoid about competition in business because if you're not, you get a bullet in the back of your head. That's like number one in business. Like if you don't worry about competition, bullets come in the back of your head for sure. Right. Um, but I'm not like, you know, the only thing I worry about with my daughter, I have a 16 year old 
who just got, she actually, she failed getting her driver's license last week. I was very happy. She called me hysterically crying. I said, do you think that's a message maybe? Maybe you should take, take this <laughs> a little bit more seriously. Maybe <laughs> you think it's just not, not something that you get. Um, she was laughing about it by the afternoon, realizing she just needs to take driving a little bit more seriously. I worry about her driving because that's the only, I tell her, by the way, like kids drink. I'm not going to worry about that. Kids have boyfriends. Kids do other things. Drivers, the, the only thing I probably have any nerves about as a parent is my daughter driving. And by the way, that scares the living shit out of me. Because one mistake, you can be dead. And so that's, um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the only place I really try to caution her. That's I did for her 16th birthday. I had the army bring a tank to my house. Um, I tried to tell her that was going to be her car. Um, I actually was, I had very bad time. And I put that on social media. And then the next day, literally Russia invaded Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And so I took it down very quickly. Uh, yeah. uh, but I literally had a tank delivered. You, you're still finding it on social media. It was kind of hilarious wow. until it was very bad timing. But yeah, I did have a tank delivered. That's why I wanted her to drive as her car. So that, that, yeah. Those are called money moves. I yeah. Think. So I'm going to say this, man. Like, I think, <laughs> I think first off, like I always try to be so grateful for people's time. Oh, yeah. uh, we understand the businesses you run, uh, the type of life you live as a man, and also uh, dealing with your family. So we're just so appreciative of you giving us the opportunity to speak with you. I think you won't ever understand what or how we see you. To be as accomplished as you are, to have worked as hard for everything you've earned, uh, owning the 76ers, obviously having to sell them eventually, but the way that you pour into our community matters to us. There's just, just many things from not only myself, but Fred Channing for you giving us your time. Um, but also from the community of you having an understanding that everyone can make a difference. And in order for our voices to be magnified, we sometimes need voices like yours. You're an amazing entrepreneur. Uh, you're an amazing story of perseverance. But more than anything, you're an amazing story of what team can do uh, together. So thank you so much, man. We wish you the best. Um, I've already gave everybody my information so I can continue to get these jerseys <laughs> yeah. I, I want to wear. But he came here. We, we he got... came here wanting to talk about, you know, fanatics and the sports gambling, a little baby documentary, and all these other I, things. Little baby documentary, sure. Up. The, by the little I baby never freeze up. Oh, it was amazing. He's the dopest rap. It's my, amazing. My... Little baby documentary was great. I went with him um, to watch it. And I'll tell you, first of all, I'm going to tell you guys, I, I need to tell you one funny thing and then close on a, on a serious note. So baby has become a good friend of mine only in the last maybe two years. And I don't think I realized how popular he was. Super, And bro. then I was, I was, yeah. I was, when the Sixers were in the playoffs, unfortunately getting their asses kicked by the Heat, mm -hmm. um, this past May, I was in a club one night with a bunch of friends. He was not there. And I really, I kept hearing his voice. Mm -hmm. I finally called him and said, I thought you were with me. I thought they were playing. I thought, thought, thought for a second like he was with me. That's why they kept he playing. He got his hits, music. bro. And I'm like, yo, you're really popular. People are like, like, because I'm not a big music guy. I'm like, like yeah. one in every three songs is your song. So that was that was a very interesting learning for me. So he's great. He's killing it. I'm proud of him. And he's doing great things in his community. Um, I'll tell you, first of all, I really appreciate the kind words you said. And I actually realized that, you know. I can have an impact on people and, and people will take something away from me. And I love that responsibility and opportunity. I'll tell you what you guys don't appreciate is how much I learned from three guys like you. And for me, I'm a sponge. And there's things I'm gonna take away. Um, from the first second you said something to me, I saw your Lids loyalty card. And by the way, I'm already thinking about ideas I can ha have with that. I got two guys in hats and one guy's not in a hat to different things with culture, to what's important to you, to what's not important right. to you, to what really resonates, to what do you really care about to where am I making more of an impact, to where am I not? So that's all, like, for me, that's, like, great stuff. So I, like, the biggest opportunity we all have is to, like, all help each other. Like, what do we have an opportunity to do? We should all push each other up. We should all help each other. We should all learn from each other and all want the best for each other because that's the way we all, like, kill it together. And I really feel that way. Well, man, thank you so much, it. man. Like, we never miss the opportunities that people give us. And for you to give us this time, for your team to be so gracious, uh, we're super grateful, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. My man. Hey, 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 OG. You were OG. Nah, for <laughs> sure. I didn't give you the title, man. Thank you, bro. Yes, sir. Man, that thank you, bro. That was What's amazing, that? No, bro. No, no, no. Hold up. Limitless. Take a simic cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a simic cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up.